Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Thursday of the month, which means we welcome back Dr. Jessica Krant, and we're going to talk about healthy skin and glowing from within. Now, guys, whenever we have a doctor on the show, a medical doctor especially, and especially Dr. Krant, we get so many questions. I'm sorry, we just can't take them from the chat, we have over 70 that have been submitted. So if you would like Dr. Krant or any of the doctors on the show to answer your questions, simply sign up for my newsletter at chefaj.com. We don't send very much out. We send maybe a recipe a week, but every Sunday we send you the schedule for the following week, Monday to Sunday, telling you the shows and the guests. All you have to do is simply reply to that email with one short question, one per email, and then we will ask it on the air. So thank you so much. And please welcome back, Dr. Krant. You are very popular. You had no idea that skin would be such a popular topic. Oh, Chef AJ, you know, everybody has skin and everybody's skin is showing to the world. So it is a very popular party topic and casual conversation topic. And it's it it's easier for people to ask their questions because they can present the evidence right, right there with the question. And I am not surprised for me, you know, this is my, my life and my livelihood and my passion. So I'm very honored to have all the questions and to have this spot to talk about the answers with you on your show. Oh, well, well, thank you. You're so knowledgeable and we thank you for your time. And you're right. Everybody has skin. So like if we had, you know, a gynecologist on, which is great, that would only apply to like half the population, but everybody has skin and skin is for all ages. You know what I mean? Like you did that from babies to from cradle to grave, you still are going to have your skin and there's so much of it. Isn't it like the largest organ in the body? It is as far as I know, the largest organ. And we do have uh, pediatric dermatologists who are medical doctors that have gone to medical school, have done residency in dermatology and a special fellowship in pediatric dermatology. So they really know the kids stuff very well. And then a lot of us general medical dermatologists and cosmetic dermatologists, we treat everybody from babies to older people. Nice. I, you know, at one point I had to see a veterinary dermatologist. That's a specialty too, because dogs have skin too. Right. Animals have skin, fur. We all have a version of fur, our yes. little hairs on us. So this, you know, we, I, we learn from, uh, you know, animal skin conditions for ourselves too. Yeah. That's so cool. I'd love to get a veterinarian. I've had a few. That's one of my favorites. That's what I used to want to be, believe it or not. Well, let's get into the questions because we do have over 70. And the first one is from Marielle. And she says, Dr. Krant, is there anything I can do to minimize the ever growing pores on the side, both sides of my nose? Is there a product or a procedure that will help? Marielle, pores around the nose. It's the natural area for pores to be larger, which is kind of right in this little lower forehead area around the nose on the sides of the cheeks here on the nose and in the chin. That's the natural area for pores to be larger. So if yours are slightly larger there, don't think anything is wrong. Pore size is very hormonally and genetically controlled. There's not a lot we can do to permanently change it, but reducing uh, oil production may help, which could be controlling hormones, possibly with uh, hormonal treatment like birth control pills that changes our hormonal milieu uh, using a retinoid, which is a vitamin A derivative like retin-A or retinol mm -hmm. can help temporarily shrink the pores and potentially reducing inflammation in our diet and our lifestyle, which would mean eating more whole fruits and vegetables and whole grains and less processed food, junk food, less animal products, less dairy and less meat may also help reduce inflammation, reduce oil production and shrink the appearance of the pores. I always say the appearance because any treatment we do does tend to temporarily reduce the appearance of the pores, but they may go back to how they looked before. It's not a permanent thing. Oh, great thing. I hear, I hear that from a lot of women that they, they seem to have that. Is it something that gets worse as they get older? Great question. I actually meant to mention that too. When I was talking about the hormonal treatment, larger pores are a product of relatively higher testosterone compared to estrogen. 
So, and you know, you can think of it like men tend to genetically have larger pores on average. So when we do get older and we go through perimenopause and menopause and our estrogen levels drop, we relatively have a higher level of testosterone and that can change the skin texture and make the pores appear to be larger. So it can be a, a product of going through menopause too. Does anything get better as we age? <laughs> our wisdom, our yes. wisdom. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So Julie says, dear Dr. K, what brand of Bakuchi oil, Bakuchi oil is the best? There are many online options. Is there a percentage that we should look for? And thank you for letting us know about this plant-based option. And maybe for people that missed previous shows, just briefly explain what Bakuchi oil or whatever that is. is. Oh, sure. Bakuchi oil is one of the first, if not the very first plant-based retinoid cousin. It is, it's like uh, the vitamin A derivatives, retinol, retinaldehyde, retinyl palmitate, and the prescriptions tretinoin, uh, Tazerac, which is Tazeratine and Adapalene, which is now over the counter sold as different in the drugstore and Adapalene, um, along with the pill Accutane, which is isotretinoin. Those are retinoid derivatives of vitamin A. Bacuchiol is a plant-based uh, molecule derived to be that has a similar action to the retinoids in terms of regulating cell production and potentially smoothing wrinkles, maybe helping to fight acne a little bit like the retinoids. Bacuchiol is relatively new on the market. And I only know of one brand name that sells it, which I learned about, I think was one of the first companies that was Burt's Bees. But a lot of companies and a lot of products contain Bacuchiol now, recognizing the market for people who want a plant-based or more gentle alternative. I don't know the answer to the percentage or which company should be used. Uh, Burt's Bees is just one company and I'm definitely not suggesting that they are the best. That's just one name I know of. Right, thank you. But there's nothing non-plant-based about Trentoin or what I can never pronounce it or Retin-A, is there? I mean, they, maybe they're tested on animals, I don't know, but there's nothing not, because you said it was just a molecule. It's a molecule. So, you know, as far as can vegan people use it, I am of the camp that believes that it's okay to use, um, but it is not derived from a plant. So it's not plant-based. But it's, it's, it's chemical then is what you're saying, but it's, it's not a chemical. It's molecule. not like an animal. Retin-A doesn't like, it's not like, you know, how sometimes a certain thyroid medication actually comes from an animal. It's not like that. Well, I don't know where they originally, originally uh, get it. I have to investigate. Yeah, they might build the molecule artificially in the lab, but there are vitamin A sources of sources of vitamin A in in plants and in, and in animals. So we would have to investigate brand by brand, I guess. Interesting. Ah, thank you. So this is from Jocelyn. She says, is vitiligo reversible with a healthy diet or raw diet, such as the protocol followed by Dr. Goldner, who also has a, sh a regular slot reversing lupus on this show? And how do you stop it for, from spreading? Do we need to reduce sun exposure? Vitiligo is the result of an autoimmune attack on the underneath layer of your own skin. When your own immune system attacks your the pigment cells of your skin, the, those patches of skin will lose pigment completely and turn white, no matter what your natural skin color is. And that is vitiligo. Some of it may be controllable or manageable or reducible with plant-based and anti-inflammatory lifestyle but some of it is also genetic and probably not possible to completely manage with a diet or lifestyle. I know Dr. Goldner has amazing comprehensive programs for managing a lot of autoimmune diseases with lifestyle. So I actually would look to her for some of the best advice on that. Thank you. Uh, as far as reducing sun exposure, I wanna comment on that. There's no evidence that reducing exposure to the sun would help vitiligo be better. In fact, one of the treatments for vitiligo is medically controlled exposure to ultraviolet light in a in a box in a in an office, which helps to trigger the cells to become active again. So the the pigment producing cells. So 
I wouldn't say reducing exposure to sunlight helps vitiligo get better, but I also would not recommend going out on your own and just getting sunburned to try to treat your own vitiligo with, without being under a dermatologist's care and guidance. Yeah. Reducing sun though has, you know, people, people are, I, 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 you probably read the pleasure trap, you know, have you read that book? It's my favorite book. F- I've read some of it and there, I do have a lot to say about sunlight, but I want to hear what you're about to say. Well, no, because what I was saying is one of the things I, 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 one of the principles that I've learned from that book is, is they always say that people are looking for health in all the wrong places, that they're always looking to add something to their diet when the true source is, is, uh, is not deficiency, but it's excesses. And, and what I'm saying is people, I don't even really, I do use skin products and I like them because they smell nice and feel nice, but I believe at least for me, and I'm just an N of one, the biggest difference in my skin at 63 is that I made a, when I moved to the desert in 2019, I stopped all sun on my face. I didn't stop going outside. I'm not afraid to go outside. I know we need vitamin D in my arms and my legs, my trunk at it. But that is because if you look at videos, I've been doing YouTube for 10 years. Look at some of my videos. You know, I haven't had people accuse me of having work. I haven't. Look at my skin back then because I would just sit in the sun. You know, I never used sunscreen before then. So I think for me, not getting sun on my face, being really diligent about either wearing sunscreen or this was even before the pandemic, I had one of those full coverage hats where you just see the eyes. I think for me, it's made a big difference. And that's what Victoria Moran, who's 10 years older than me has said as well. Well, Victoria Moran is, is a classic vegan beauty, as we know, like supermodel level. So she's a good, she's a good advocate for that. I agree that where we want to avoid the sun is definitely on our faces and on our necks and the back of our hands, but getting some sun exposure. I, as a dermatologist, I will say out loud that getting some sun exposure is also healthy for us. Um, some it helps to produce vitamin D in our skin naturally, but it also has been shown that it helps to regulate our immune systems to get some sun, not only on our skin, but to get sunlight also on our eyeballs to regulate our circadian rhythms both of which help to reduce the risk of cancers in general overall. So the sun sun exposure is a complicated topic and we're we're learning more nuanced science behind it uh, on a daily basis right now. Nice, thanks. This is from Heidi. What does Dr. Krant think about PRP, platelet-rich plasma, microneedling for facial wrinkles and for growing hair? And what about charcoal facials, fibroblasts, and deep heat radio frequency? I got to be honest, I've never heard of any of those techniques. That might be too many different uh, treatments for me to respond about in one answer, but let me see what I do. <clears throat> PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, is a concept where we would our, we get our own blood drawn at the doctor's office. It gets spun so that the growth factors are concentrated and the red part of the blood is taken out. That clearish liquid of growth factors is then put back either into our skin with needle injections or onto our skin rubbed in after microneedling. I think the debate is still out about whether that PRP has a long lasting effect or whether it's the controlled injury of the microneedling and of the injections triggering our own inherent growth factors that are already in our skin, which will be triggered by this injury. Um, it triggering a wound healing cycle in our skin does help to rejuvenate some of the cells. We just have to be careful that we're not creating so much injury that we're overall injuring rather than creating controlled acute injury, which has positive acute inflammatory effects and not chronic inflammatory damaging effects. Great. Thanks. All right. I wonder where you get those probably are these procedures done at doctor's offices or like at, um, they should be done by board certified skin focused specialists, board certified dermatologists, board certified plastic surgeons in the, in offices for the most part, and then it's an invasive procedure. Are all plastic surgeons, they, they call them cosmetic surgeons, don't they? They don't, they prefer that name. Are they all also dermatologists, but not all dermatologists are cosmetic surgeons? This is a complex topic. 
board certified dermatologists are medical physicians who went to medical school who specialize in a residency in dermatology, which is the health of the skin, nails, and hair, and also includes surgical training, cosmetic training, laser training, and also a fellowship in a subspecialty of skin cancer surgery that I did called Mohs surgery. So I am a fellowship trained Mohs surgeon, as well as a medical and a cosmetic dermatologist. But only board certified dermatologists who did a dermatology residency can call themselves dermatologists. Plastic surgeons actually went to medical school, reg real medical school, like the dermatologist, and they did residency training in possibly general surgery and then plastic surgery or a longer plastic surgery focused residency training after medical school. And they call themselves plastic surgeons. They are board certified plastic surgeons. Anybody who did not do a plastic surgery residency should not be calling themselves plastic surgeons. Plastic surgeons can be reconstructive plastic surgeons who really only work on trauma and reconstruction, medical, or they can be cosmetic plastic surgeons who do only cosmetic surgery. Some dermatologists who have a lot of dermatologic surgery training, like I do, and who also may have especially extensive cosmetic procedure training, also do cosmetic surgical procedures, like maybe eyelid blepharoplasties or liposuction. Um, but there are, there's an American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, which includes doctors from different specialties who all happen to do cosmetic surgery and cosmetic procedures. So a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery is not necessarily a board certified dermatologist or a board certified plastic surgeon. They may be from another specialty and have had some kind of outside extra training. Yeah. I some, still, oh, sorry. No, because I remember like, like 30 years ago when I went to a gynecologist, he was doing liposuction and I'm like, but you're a gynecologist. He goes, oh, I took a course. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. I took a Right, course. right. You yeah. know, I do have very specific feelings about all of this. I'm sure your your audience can can read between the lines. But I do want to say there are people out there saying they're practicing dermatology. And that should not really be allowed if they are not a board certified dermatologist or working directly for a board certified dermatologist who is overseeing the work. There's a lot of dermatology services offered in other types of offices. And without a dermatologist there, to me, that is something that should be, you know, more thoroughly examined. Great. Thank you. All right. The next question is. What is the best cosmetic procedure for erasing sunspots on the face and hands? And is it really possible to get rid of brown sun age spots on the hands and arms and broken capillaries on the face? There are a lot of uh, topical creams and solutions for brown spots, but I must say that in many cases, starting with a laser is really your best bet. A laser that specifically targets brown because each laser targets a different color target or a different type of skin target. Lasers that target brown include the ruby laser, the alexandrite laser, and then some rejuvenative lasers that just remove skin cells in general, aimed and controlled by a board certified dermatologist or plastic surgeon can also be used to do non-ablative or ablative rejuvenation of the skin. Even with laser procedures, that those skin areas are prone to recreate the brown spots. I just want to say that right now. They're very stubborn. They're sort of known as a running joke at dermatology meetings because they are notoriously stubborn to get rid of. Even when you think you have a technique that works, they will tend to come back with the next sun exposure. So it becomes a case of treating and then maintaining. And a lot of topical skin products these days are really well focused on reducing pigment. Tranexamic acid, which is abbreviated TXA, has now been used topically to some advantage. 
There's a, pr a product called cysteamine, which also reduces um, pigment production. Kojic acid, hydro, the famous hydroquinone, um, even soy is known to truly reduce pigment production. And also um, trying to think of some other topical, more, more plant-based, but these all do help to reduce the creation of new pigment. But when these products are stopped, the pigment will tend to want to come back, especially in a case of something like melasma, which is not the same as sunspots. Sunscreen, 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 sun protective clothing, gloves, and avoiding strong midday sun are really your best bets if you want to work on it as an entire program altogether. Nice. Thank you. What can I do to help spread Retin-A on my face? I know you told me the little secret. This is my favorite question because I do have a little, <laughs> a little secret. I think a lot of people are told to mix the retinoid into the moisturizer, but that's not my favorite way because when I think about it that way, I think of that some of the molecules of the retinoid will be on the top level of the moisturizer. Some will be in the middle and some will be on the bottom and you're not getting your best advantage of all of your retinoid. So I prefer the technique that I tell my patients in the office, my secret technique, which is to use a very small pearl on one fingertip, the tip, tip, tip of the finger, not the front of the finger, but the tip, and then spread it on eight fingertips all together like this so that each fingertip is just wet. And then divide evenly, tap all around individual fingers one at a time first so the retinoid dots are evenly spread then go back and lightly rub them in. So now all of your small amount of retinoid is evenly divided on your face. Then if you want to, you can put a little moisturizer on top of that. If the, even that technique is too harsh for you, then you can do moisturizer first, wait a little while, and then do that spreading technique. There are some doctors who advocate doing retino retinoids a few nights a week and working up. I prefer to do less more regularly. My, my way, my preferred way is to do a small amount, but nightly, and then gradually increase the amount from there. Nice. Now, is it okay to do it like right out of the shower with a wet face? Cause I think it spreads better when your skin is wet. Don't you? It does spread quicker and better when your skin is wet, but damp skin is highly sensitized. It's sort of like, uh, made transparent by the water. So what will happen is that the retinoid that you're using, whether it be over the counter retinol or a strong prescription will get absorbed very quickly. It will go on all at once very quickly. And that actually creates a harsh environment, a harsh reaction, which will create more redness, more peeling and more irritation. Oh. So at first you might not be able to tolerate that. And that's my, why I say wait for a long time after your skin has been damp and potentially put on that moisturizer barrier first. But over time, if you really work your skin up and get used to it over months and a couple of years, you might be able to tolerate your retinoid right on your face when you first get out of the shower. And if so, you'll get a more robust reaction, which will be a more dramatic response. As long as you can tolerate it, that's fine. But it's important when you're on that not to be in the sun so much, right? Well, one of the things it does is actually exfoliate your skin a little faster than normal. So we call them quote unquote dead skin cells, although dermatologists don't really believe that any cell is dead on the skin. It all has biologic function, but it, a retinoid will, will um, those outer skin cells will jump off faster. So you actually do have less of a protective layer from the sun. We naturally have an, an SPF of about two on our skin. Um, we get less protection when we use a retinol regu retinoid regularly. So if you're gonna go that route, especially if you're being aggressive with it, you are at higher risk for sunburn. And you're also ironically at higher risk for getting sun damage that will lead to wrinkling. So it is worth, thinking about sun protection while you're using a retinoid for those two reasons, but it's not that being in the sun makes the retinoid dangerous per se. Okay. And then if people like, I know some women wax their face, they probably shouldn't do that if they're on something that makes the skin so sensitive, right? 
Well, especially uh, waxing for those little, the little fine baby hairs here on the sensitive cheek. Mm -hmm. But if you're ever uh, either, either threading or waxing eyebrows or waxing your lip or your chin, make sure that you think about whether any of your products contain retinoids because a salon should ask you to stop your retinoid for about a week before. But if you're doing it at home, you might not realize, and you, it really does make your skin more prone to getting peeled off. So it could tear off your skin. Wow. That's good to know. Thank you. That's just very helpful for people that are on it or starting it. This question is very uh, often asked by people in my audience. And is there anything that can be done about loose skin that happened while losing weight? Now that I'm 57, I've been plant-based for three years. I exercise regularly. I hoped with a good diet and exercise, the skin would tighten up, but it isn't. Unfortunately, there's not a great, great magic answer for this the way we wish there were. Um, when our, when we're younger and we're gaining and losing weight, our skin does adjust a little bit better where we, the skin will expand. And when we're younger, we have a lot of elastin and collagen that's still intact um, and healthy. Those that healthy adipose layer does create new cells that help the skin reshape as we get older. And especially through and past menopause, we lose a lot of elasticity of our skin, a lot of moisture, and that does cause the skin to be thinner and less snap back less. That is a factor of hormones really. And just a uh, skin being on our body over that extra amount of time. There's not a lot we can do about it. In extreme cases, it really may be worth investigating having the skin, skin removal surgery because it can just make you feel a lot better and put everything where, where you want it to be. But moisturizers that contain skin thickeners that can thicken up the outer layer of the skin a little bit, like ammonium lactate and urea can help the skin outer surface to be a little bit juicier and feel a little bit smoother. Retinoids also can help to kind of make the outer layer of the skin a little healthier and potentially trigger new collagen formation underneath, which is part of what it does for our faces. But it would be hard to do that all over the body in enough amount to notice a difference. So don't be afraid to investigate the surgery option if that would be a good option for you. Right. You know, she mentioned exercise, but I'm curious, did she exercise before or after losing weight? And the reason I ask is I've worked with so many people now that have lost anywhere from 50 to 300 pounds. And the ones that ha had a lifelong history of exercise, even when they were overweight or even obese, they seem to fare better when they lost extraordinary amounts of weight than people that like never exercised. Well, research has shown, uh, you know, I am also I, in addition to being a board certified dermatologist, I am also board certified in lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine is about the six pillars of healthy lifestyle that not only can prevent chronic disease, but also may reverse some of it and lead us to live our healthiest lives. In addition to food as medicine being one of the pillars, which for me is being a hundred percent plant-based exercise is also one of the pillars. And I have noticed in my research on how these lifestyle pillars affect our skin health and anti-aging, that there is research showing that regular exercise does keep the skin looking younger and probably also biologically acting younger. Regular exercise also helps to lengthen our telomeres, which are the covering tips on the ends of our DNA strands so they don't unravel and fall apart. So exercise literally keeps us younger and it also creates an environment that keeps our skin behaving younger. So I believe that long time lifelong exercisers probably do have skin that reacts better to changes over time. Great. Thanks. All right. Next up is a question about teens. What is the best way for teens to deal with acne that doesn't involve prescription drugs? Well, first of all, let me say that teenage acne is normal. It's a normal and common part of being a teenager. And it can even start before 
you know, even young girls would get their period before menarche. It's a little bit of preteen acne starts very, very young. And it has to do with hormonal changes. So sometimes kids do need medicine and parents should not be afraid if some lifestyle changes are not enough to take their kids to a board certified dermatologist because getting acne that causes scarring and even, even acne, even bad acne in junior high and high school that doesn't end up scarring really affects kids emotionally and socially. Even if they say it doesn't bother them, they may already be emotionally retreating so that it won't, so that nothing will bother them. Um, so they won't feel bad about it if they get teased. That said, before going to a dermatologist, if possible, there is proof that dairy in the diet is one of the number one dietary triggers for acne. And dairy can trigger acne in at least five different ways. Besides milk having milk sugars, which is lactose, and sugar being a trigger, dairy and especially cow dairy also contains milk and dairy proteins that trigger inflammation directly, which also is a trigger for acne. In addition, the hormones in milk, because milk is a hormonal beverage for a baby cow, the hormones in milk trigger oil production and increased pore size and also trigger acne in that way. So there are at least three different pathways of at least five different causes for dairy to trigger acne in teens. Moms and dads should also be aware and young people watching should also be aware that when you're trying to be healthy, you may be taking protein shakes, protein bars, and things like that. And the most common protein in those is called whey protein. Whey is dairy. Whey is a dairy protein. So people who drink a lot of protein shakes and eat a lot of protein bars and do protein supplements, especially teenagers, especially young men, may actually be breaking out a lot more because of the whey protein. So even if it's somebody who says, oh, I don't eat dairy, they may be taking protein supplements thinking they need to supplement the protein and getting dairy accidentally um, from a surprise direction. So watch out for whey protein as well. Nice. Thank you. Dairy is scary. How is How to treat nasolabial folds is dermal filler effective? And maybe please explain both those words because not everybody knows. Sure. I think uh, a lot of people call nasolabial folds, the folds that go from the nose, the naso to the lips, the labial, <laughs> excuse me. People also call these same folds melolabial because melo is cheek. So the fold between the cheek and the lip, the melolabial fold and the nasolabial fold. These folds get more prominent, unfortunately, as we get older because we lose that elastin, we lose the collagen, and we lose some of the hydration, and we lose the, honestly, the, the what we call the baby fat. We lose that fat, that fatty layer just under the surface of the skin that keeps our cheeks juicy, robust, and give us that apple of the cheek when we're young. So as we get older, that skin, I'm going to do something terrible on camera right now, but that skin sags down and I'm going to look like a before and after picture right now. So this is normal aging. The skin on the cheek just falls down because there's nothing holding it up anymore. So it makes more of a shadow here and here. And that's that nasolabial fold that everyone talks about. Um, one of the best procedures that's easiest to access is a little bit of filler, a little bit of dermal filler, which is a substance that goes, gets injected under the skin into the dermal layer, which is under the epidermal outer layer. In the old days, we used to do a lot of filler right here in the nasolabial fold, thinking that it would fill in that shadow and take away that appearance. Well, we've since learned, and I tend to focus now on not trying to fill in that space because that's a natural human face shape. And people were filling it up so much, they actually were getting what we call a simian look, which is like Curious George. Like it would just get so full here and be protruding instead of fixing a natural human face shape. So now 
we put dermal filler up in the cheek area here to recreate the fullness of the cheek and see how it lifts away. I have good lighting for this. See how it lifts away my cheek back up to where it used to be in high school and takes away that shadow. So dermal filler in the cheek appropriately done and not trying to overfill to lift more than can really be lifted. Lifting backwards in this sort of up and back direction is really a good starter procedure for fixing some of that nasolabial fold a little bit. Here it is on the other side. So it's not really a pulling, like face lift pulls back, but it leaves everything here very skinny. Filler recreates the fullness and the correct shape of the cheek that we had when we were younger. If it gets too full, it's out of proportion and inappropriate. And then when we smile, it bunches everything up here. So that's not right either. Somebody with good aesthetic uh, taste and a good eye, good hand eye coordination and artistic sense should be able to help you go back to a more natural look for you from a few years ago without making you look unnatural. Wow. Thank you. But is it true? I mean, can, can there be side effects to fillers? Like I, I, somebody I heard mm -hmm. said they went blind from them. Is that possible? Oh, absolutely. Uh, filler is a truly invasive procedure that although the risks are more rare, some of the risks are very dangerous and filler is a a hyaluronic acid filler, which is one of the safest fillers because it's, it is made from a natural molecule that's already in our own skin. Hyaluronic acid fillers are still a physical gel substance. And if they get injected into a blood vessel where they don't belong, it can travel back through the foramen, foramina, which is a little hole in our skull, I'm sorry to say, and get into the brain. It can cause blindness. It could potentially cause a stroke. And least risky um, would be that it can actually cause some deadening of the skin tissue if it blocks blood flow to the skin. If this, if these issues are recognized early, right away by an expert injector, physician, for the most part, they can be ameliorated or mitigated. The blindness one is is more in question. That's that's a pretty dangerous side effect. It is true emergency. Um, knock on wood, I've never had it happen to any of my patients. I'm extremely careful about where and how I inject, and I'm aware of the depth of my injections and the location because I did that facial skin cancer surgery fellowship training. So I really have a deeper understanding of the facial, the true facial anatomy. But there are areas that are higher risk to inject, such as filler going into this area is extremely high risk, filler into the temples and filler anywhere around here and the upper lip are, are risky areas for those kinds of complications. So definitely see somebody appropriately trained and experienced. Great, thanks. I would like to know how the pros and cons of Sculptra on the face, I'm 68. Sculptra is a different type of, I wouldn't say necessarily filler, but Sculptra is rather than being a cohesive gel that itself gets injected, Sculptra is tiny separated molecules of a substance that eventually can be dissolved by the skin, but it is diluted with a liquid and then injected in multiple areas to create a intentional inflammatory response by the skin, which may lay down some more collagen and trigger more elastin formation. It does trigger short-term temporary inflammatory response. So your skin does look fuller. I'm not sure of the long, long-term last, long lasting effects. I don't know if it really lasts longer than about six months. Some people have had great responses with it and really believe in it. And other people feel like the, the effect goes away. So Sculptra does require um, seeing somebody with experience with specifically with Sculptra, and they may have their own technique for how they can get it to work better. Great. Thank you. All right. Sagging skin on jaw. Any help for that? Boy, these are, these are all in a theme. <laughs> um, 
jawline is just like the cheek. You know, when I did this, you could see you get this kind of thinner skin here. Although this skin gets thin as we get older and that skin does tend to hang down. Now there are fillers that are specifically FDA approved to go into the jawline here. I would be careful and not let anybody put so much filler in the jawline that you end up with a heavy looking jaw. I'm very uh, aware of that, wary of it, and it's not my favorite look. I don't like it when people get too much put in a chin or a jaw to try to tighten skin, because to me that re makes the lower face just look heavy. And what we really want to recreate is more of a heart-shaped face. So I'm still a fan of filling here first, trying to fill up the skin and lift and see what gets lifted here. And then maybe a little bit around the angle of the jaw to just tighten there. We also do a little Botox down here. And Botox is the molecule that doesn't take up space, but it relaxes muscles. So if you get these bands from talking and smiling that where it pulls under your neck, Botox there can just help relax the skin back up against the jaw. That's sometimes called the Nefertiti neck lift or Nefertiti jaw lift, just little small amounts of Botox here. And together, a little bit of filler, a little bit of Botox can help in that. There are also skin tightening procedures using different energies, using um, ultrasound and other types of energy. They do help temporarily, but they are really not permanent unless you do them very frequently. It can be very expensive. They can be uncomfortable. And if the energy is turned up too high to try to get too much of a response in one treatment, there's a pretty high risk for damaging your cutaneous and connective tissue and potentially getting unevenness and burns. So also, again, see somebody very experienced in any skin tightening procedure. Yep. And how do you feel about when people go to other countries to save money on, on things like, uh, what's it called, gastric bypass and all kinds of, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to disparage other countries, but some of the horror stories that I've heard that they can happen in this country, but some of the ones, at least the ones you see on television seem to happen in some of these countries, mainly in the aftercare. The, there's a lot of, a lot of mixed, I have a lot of mixed feelings about all of that. I completely understand the drive to get the same procedure somewhere else much cheaper. You know, sometimes people can fly to another country, get a whole procedure and fly back cheaper than it is to get it done here. There are some reasons for that. Um, when you get a procedure done here, if there's anything that goes wrong, your physician hopefully is the one who is helping you take care of those either expected or common or less expected complications or side effects and helping you get through everything. It's, it's continuity of care that's very valuable. Here, they're pretty strong for the most part in terms of regulating who can do what, although that is getting much looser lately. So here, if you're getting a procedure done, you mostly at least can find out what the credentials are of the person doing it. I don't know how that goes in other countries or what the regulations are. The biggest problem is when people go to another country and as you said, have something done and come back here, they have a complication and then they want to try to find a doctor here who will help them take care of whatever went wrong when they were out of the country. And that's a, a very unfortunate and awkward position to try to put a US physician in. For the most part, if they're not doing the procedure here, it's because they don't feel that it's they're trained to do it or, or it's safe for them to do it. So they don't want you to come back and then ask for help with the thing that you were not encouraging them to do in the first place. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. All right. This is about moisturizing. I am 62. Is it possible to only moisturize daily or should we older women use moisturizer under the eyes, the face, the neck daily or multiple times a day? Everyone's skin is different. If you feel like you have to moisturize constantly, there might be something else in the routine that is being done that is causing excessive dryness. So first look at that. Make sure there's not overwashing, overstripping, overuse of retinoids, overuse of multiple layers of different, you know, peeling acids and then retinoids. Sometimes we're just treating our skin too harshly or over cleansing it. I am a fan of washing your face whenever you need to or want to. 
Some people are completely against washing the face. I'm not one of those people, but I also know that there are some people that are washing their faces three times a day and then wondering why they're so dry. So first make a balanced routine, see your dermatologist or a well-trained esthetician for guidance on that. And then use the lightest moisturizer that works for you. You can also layer a light sort of a hyaluronic acid type of a moisturizer with a more uh, occlusive moisturizer for nighttime or for winter, sealing in our own moisture so it doesn't leak out of our skin is, is always a good option too, winter especially. Yeah. All right. I don't know what this is, a Venus Lake, but this lady has one on her lip. She had it removed and it came back. Do you recommend anything topical to put on it to make it smaller or any other treatment? A Venus Lake is actually kind of a bubble of a blood vessel in the lip that has expanded and bubbled up to the surface. It looks a little bluish or purplish. It is a physically dilated blood vessel. So there's really no cream that will shrink that down. We do try to reduce them by treating with laser. Um, it might need multiple treatments or it may need treatments over time or potentially physically burning it or sealing it or cauterizing it, depending on what it looks like. They can be stubborn. In an extreme, extreme case, it might need a little surgery to seal it off. Ooh, okay. And that would be done by a dermatologist, right? Dermatologic surgeon or plastic surgeon, depending on the experience level of the physician and the case of, of, you know, exactly what's going on with that Venus Lake. Great. It is definitely a physical growth, a physical condition that needs a physical treatment. Perfect. I have eczema, seborrhea behind my ears, really bad. Are there any natural remedies to help without having to use creams that have steroids? Well, Behind the ears, unless it's an allergic contact dermatitis to something like a shampoo or, or a glass earpiece from glasses, it is probably seborrheic dermatitis, which is not eczema. They are two different medical conditions. Seborrheic dermatitis is a flaky redness and itching that is caused by the buildup of, or reaction to a yeast called pterosporum. And this pterosporum is the same yeast that causes dandruff. Dandruff is the common term for what we call seborrheic dermatitis. It can also cause flakiness in the eyebrows here, flakiness and redness around the nose, on the chin. In men, it commonly can cause a red flaky rash right in the center of the chest here. That's all the same entity and it's all basically dandruff in different areas. The best way to manage that is not with a topical steroid. In my opinion, I'm really reluctant to use topical steroids chronically on the face. Um, in an emergency or for a weekend of events, it's perfectly fine. It's, it is an emergency anti-inflammatory, but it doesn't kill the yeast buildup that's causing the inflammatory reaction. I think the best way to treat seborrheic dermatitis is by controlling the yeast itself. We can do that by um, making sure we have plenty of nuts and seeds in our diet because zinc is one of the nutrients that helps to control seborrhea. If diet alone is not enough, um, there are soaps that actually contain zinc and zinc pyrithione that are made to treat seborrheic dermatitis. They're very effective, they're gentle, and they can be used on the face, around the ears. And there are, of course, dandruff shampoos. Over-the-counter dandruff shampoos contain gentle medications that do work to kill the yeast. That's zinc pyrithione, that is selenium sulfide, and that is ketoconazole, all in over-the-counter preparations. So you, you'd be able to find these things online or in the store, without needing steroids at all. But this is a chronic condition. Unless your lifestyle, your stress level, your hormones dramatically change, you'll probably be dealing with it on and off, you know, most of your life. So don't be discouraged if you're not curing it in two weeks, 
it does tend to come back. You just have to keep managing it. And the other thing I want to say is, believe it or not, UV ultraviolet exposure does actually help it reduce. So if you're in a sunny, if you live in a sunny area, you probably tend to have it less. Cool. All right. Next question. What part of the body is it safe to get vitamin D directly from the sun and what time of day and for how long should the exposure be without sunscreen? Well, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of new research. I mean, there's been research for decades on the fact that although dermatologists generally say avoid the sun, some sun exposure is healthy for us too, both for our mood, our circadian rhythm, um, and also for our immune systems. There's a new field, which is fascinating to me called immuno, uh, photo immunology, which is about the sun light itself directly affecting our immune systems. In fact, research is showing that the higher latitude we live, the further away from the equator, the higher likelihood that people might have an autoimmune condition like, um, multiple sclerosis and even, even things like that. Very, very dramatic evidence that living closer to the equator reduces the chance in the, in the population that people will have these conditions. So I have become, you know, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale in South Florida on the beach, beach, beach in the sun, 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 getting tan, tan, tan. And then when I became a dermatologist, I thought, oh no, the sun is my enemy. I better not get any sun on me. And I became this pale person you see before you now. Um, when I used to have a nickname of the band of Soleil lady, because I was so dark, oh, only older people will know what I'm talking about, but the woman on the billboard for band of Soleil tanning products. I was remember so that dark. band of Soleil for that San Tropez tan. I totally right. remember that. <laughs> I was so tan that that was my nickname. So I have, and I was blonde from the sun. So I have become a reverse negative of myself. But now I'm softening on that a little bit, although I don't want my face to get sun, like we said, because I don't want to encourage wrinkles and discoloration. But I, you know, I know now that getting some sunlight on my, maybe my arms, my legs, my, my back um, is good for vitamin D production, but vitamin D levels may just be a marker for a healthy amount of UV exposure in general, because the ultraviolet rays themselves are directly affecting the immune action in our skin, which affects our immune systems in general. Besides the fact that the ultraviolet rays and the blue rays from the sky are affecting our, our mood and our circadian rhythm, which affects our cancer risk, our sleep cycles, and our overall health. It's really complicated and fascinating. So what's the right amount of sun exposure? Do not get sunburned because sunburns are an independent risk factor for skin cancer and skin cancer can kill you. So it's not, it's not nothing. It is real cancer. Um, but we do not mind a little bit of warming in the sun for 15 to 30 minutes on the less aggressive side of an afternoon, you know, like, um, late morning or late afternoon, not in the middle, middle of the most burning part of the day, getting a little sun on you, especially in an area that you can monitor for changes. It's hard to watch the tops of our heads. It's hard to watch our backs, but a little bit on arms and legs, protecting the areas that you don't want to get wrinkly, you know, may have some health benefit. Yeah. You know, I, I I have a friend who's bald and he has really aggressive skin cancer, you know, from, from the, the top of the head being burned, you know? Yes. And unfortunately, you know, melanoma, there are three types of skin cancer, three common types. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common and the least aggressive, but can still be deadly. Squamous cell carcinoma is the type of skin cancer that can also be cancer of the bladder, cancer of the lung, the squamous cells line our organs. So lines our skin, it lines our bladder, it lines our lungs. That's the surface layer of our internal organs. Um, squamous cell carcinoma is midway in risk between melanoma, the deadliest, and basal cell carcinoma. 
but squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck is actually unusually aggressive and really can cause a lot of people terrible, terrible damage. Um, tongue cancer, jaw cancer, skin cancer of the ear, the head and neck can, can easily spread into the brain. So do take it seriously, wear a hat, wear sunscreen, don't get sunburns on your head and neck. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in the previous question about nuts and seeds for zinc. Are there other foods that have zinc that are not nuts and seeds? Oh, Chef AJ, you might be able to answer that better than I can. I can't think off the top of my head. I'm sure leafy greens and all fruits and vegetables probably contain good levels of zinc. Um, I do know that vitamin C, people don't think of it as collagen building, but I just want to mention, since we're talking about skin, that vitamin C is a necessary cofactor for not only being an antioxidant and fighting sun damage, but it also helps to build collagen. Since we may be plant-based here and vegan and not eating collagen supplements because they are animal-based, don't forget vitamin C as a cofactor when you want to approximate taking collagen supplements. We can just make our own collagen inside by eating a wide variety of whole high fiber plant foods. Nice. Thank you. Well, I want to respect your time. So we probably have time for just one more question because you give such thorough and thoughtful answers. And this is probably something everyone would like to know. Is there a way to get rid of wrinkles besides surgery or Botox? Million dollar question. If you could do that, oh my God, you'd be like a millionaire. Um, how about Zoom camera filters. Yeah. But how are we going to walk around? I mean, it's fine when we're on zoom, but what do we do? Walk around like this with a little, no, I think we need to meet in the middle and have a combination of gratefully aging and being glad for the life experience that we've had that has led us to this day where there are now some wrinkles there showing there when, especially when we smile, smile a lot because it hides all the wrinkles we don't want. And also, um, I, I really have to say that evidence has proven to me that a whole food plant-based diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and dark leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables provides all of the nutrients to keep the skin staying its youngest. And we are able to reverse some aging with a, with a whole food plant-based diet and protecting from additional sun damage. So people's skin do, does actually look better over time once we've changed our lifestyle, gotten away from smoking and pollution and uh, processed junk foods, late night junk foods, getting better nights of sleep. All of these things are scientifically proven to improve our skin quality. Yeah. Smoking has got to be the absolute worst thing for the skin. Would you agree? I mean, there's not much worse, is there? Smoking is probably the worst single thing other than too much sun, but sun also has health benefits and smoking does not. Right. Or so, so take home is if you're going to smoke, don't smoke in the sun. No, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just kidding. We hope that people would be able to stop if they're doing that. Well, you are just, you're really smart. I mean, I just, I, you know, I, I, I think I learned more here. You should really, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Roger Schwelt, who has a, a really successful YouTube channel. He was my doctor when I lived in the desert, quadruple board certified and his, his, his uh, it's called MedCram. You could do that with this. You're, you know, you could totally do that. I mean, I'll help you, but like you, you, it seems like there's no question you can't answer or if you can't you'll look it up like the one about where does retin-a originate from an animal from a plant or where who knows that'll be maybe next time you know we still have 50 questions left so guys you can see why we can't take it from the chat we're so sorry but thank you i look forward to you coming back next month and, and getting as many questions answered as you can thank you chef aj and as i pledged at, at the launch of our new format last month uh, any question that I can't really answer that I'm trying to answer here with you all, I will look up and eventually answer in a future show. So do stay tuned, everybody, and please do submit your own new questions because we will answer those submitted questions first. And then we'll always go back to our other bank of questions too. 
Great. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous plant-based doctor, Dr. Nikki Davis, who's going to be talking about the healing power of smoothies and even demonstrating a few. Take care, everyone.